It's a phenomenon that has grabbed the attention of a growing number of CIOs. It's called big data. Companies nowadays have access to an incredible amount of data. Network devices and applications are collecting more data than ever before, and there are no signs that this will abate. Some market researchers estimate the data will grow by 50 times by 2020. There are patterns in all this data, which can be used for competitive advantage. On the other hand, the data is a challenge to manage. Hi, I'm Deborah Bulkley, Senior Managing Editor of CIO's Custom Solutions Group. How can companies efficiently collect and analyze all of this data and generate information that will benefit the business? Joining me now is someone who has many valuable insights on this topic. Dave Mariani is Vice President of Engineering at Clout, a social networking analytics site that's in the business of measuring online influence. When we talk about big data, consider this. Clout processes billions of user data signals from the social web every day. Posts coming from Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, blogs, and more. Welcome, Dave. Hi, Deborah. Dave, let's start off by you telling us about Clout, how it got started, what the business is all about. Sure. Clout was founded by uh, Joe Fernandez and Ben Tran back in 2008. The idea came to Joe after he had jaw surgery and had his jaw wired shut for several weeks. And during that time, Joe used social media to really connect to the world. And what he found was that there was really uh, something missing in the social web. Besides it just being fragmented, it was very difficult to be able to uh, sort the, the wheat from the chaff, to clear out the noise and to communicate and reach people that he was interested in and that he thought he should connect to. So that's where the idea for Clout was hatched, was in Joe's apartment when his jaw was wired shut, drinking soup through a straw. We're headquartered in San Francisco in the South of Market District. Um, we're venture-backed with our lead being Kiner Perkins, and we're over 50 employees. So really, Clout's mission is to help everybody understand and leverage their influence. We use something we call the Clout Score as really a benchmark to judge and to measure yourself against your peers and other people who are influential in topics or subjects. So Clout really has become the standard for influence in social media and online. And what we're really trying to do is to help people to recognize that and leverage that so that they can build their own social brand. So how do we do that? Clout uses big data to really unify and tie together all these different social networks into one unified social web. So uh, we have three different customer segments that we serve. We have our consumers who are helping to leverage and build their, their own social brand. We have brand advertisers and brands who are looking to reach influencers at scale. And then we have our data partners who are looking to add value to their, their product or service so they can recognize people and their influence and their needs on the web. We do all this by collecting data across the different so social networks. So when you come to Clout and you register with Clout, you have the option of linking your accounts for which you're active on the social web. For example, Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn. When you link those accounts, we then collect data and the signals, the content and the network that you're connected to, and we collect those signals, almost a billion per day, and add value to those signals by taking the raw data, using science to create new data in the form of cloud scores, topics, targeting data like demographic and geographic information, as well as just your social graph and your network to be able to provide value to this ecosystem. Okay, so this is really interesting. What is the benefit for consumers? Cloud helps consumers to manage their social presence on the web. So in this case, this is a screenshot of Joe Fernandez's, our, our CEO's personal page. And what you can see here is that Joe can quickly understand how he's doing compared to his peers or to others that are influential in topics that he's interested in. And he can also um, see what the impact is um, and how he's doing on the different social networks. We provide consumers with insights to help manage their uh, effectiveness on their social web. 
everybody is influential in, in, in something, and lots of us are influential in lots of different subjects or topics. So what's very important to clout and, and, and to the consumer experience is that we can surface interesting content and also surface topics or subjects where you're influential or, whether, or where you want to track or follow people who are influential in those topics. So we use things like natural language processing and business intelligence to detect and surface those, those topics or subjects where you can rate yourself and follow others to help surface content um, that, that is most relevant to you. So given that, how does clout help brands reach these influencers? That's a good question. So for brands, well, who's, which is our, our, our second customer segment, it's all about reaching influencers at scale. In Audi's case, they, they ran what we call a, a perks campaign with clout. And what, the way this works is that uh, they want to target auto enthusiasts in certain markets to support the launch of the new model of the Audi A8. With clout, they were able to, at scale, target and reach auto enthusiasts in each market uh, to provide them with early access to the A8 before anybody else has seen it and gave them the ability to drive the car uh, for a period of time. So for the clout consumer, they get access to products or services that they're interested in and passionate about and for the brand, Audi, they get to reach influential social media users who are most likely to talk about their experience with their products. And of course, that all adds up to scalable word of mouth advertising. And what we found is that with really just a few influencers targeted for a perk can result into huge numbers, in this case over 50 million impressions um, of, that, of that experience. So um, it really is about consumers creating their own personal advertising about a brand for a brand. Here's another example. This particular perk was to give away a one-year supply of secret deodorant to influential women. This was one that you would think that, okay, well, I'm getting free deodorant. Why is that so exciting? But generated lots of online buzz. And so for the brand, Secret, they end up getting over 15 million impressions. Uh, for the consumers, they end up getting a product that they, they liked and they talked about it online. And it's a product that they may have gotten, uh, actually bought in the store or maybe not. In any case, uh, it really drove awareness of this new secret uh, deodorant brand and generated lots of user-generated advertising for the secret brand. Those are two great examples. Now, can you tell us how you use data to help your partners? Yeah, so clout data, when it comes to clout scores and then you know, topical scores and, or subjects where, where users are influential, you can imagine that that's really valuable to um, a variety of different partners or products and services. It, and they really range from more CRM-related applications uh, where it's very important to know who your potential customer or prospect is and what they're interested in and targeting them for, you know, specifically for products or services that they would be, that would be most relevant to them. Uh, to um, consumer brands who are interested in recognizing customers in advance so that they can treat them um, with special care. A couple examples. The first is, uh, is the Palms Hotel. So they used clout scores and clout data to augment their customer rewards program. So for, for those with um, high clout scores, they would uh, offer a, a room upgrade during their stay. To the consumer, the consumer gets a free room upgrade. To Palms, they, uh, by, by targeting influential social users, uh, they're most apt to get a positive experience and talked about online. Um, which helps their brand. Because uh, uh, people with high clout uh, will, will just, they can't help themselves from talking about their experience. So if it's a positive experience, the brand benefits. Another example is, uh, which is quite different, which is uh, using clout data and topics and scores to better curate data on Huffington Post. So in this case, Huffington Post has used clout 
to be able to identify influential people that may be relevant to the consumer reading their, um, their news stories. So in this case, it's about using clout scores and topics to help better surface relevant uh, content to users. So what's your goal here? Our goal really is to really use clout and knit it into the, the fabric of the web. So, you know, big data makes all this possible. You know, I've mentioned before that we actually process over a, a billion social signals a day for over 100 million users every day. Um, that ends up generating lots and lots of data. And just collecting the data is, of course, hard enough, but it's not about collection. You need to really add intelligence to that data to make sense of it and make it relevant and useful for our three different customer segments, our consumers, our brands, and our data partners. An interesting graphic here that you see is that we've been quite successful of really weaving the, the clout score and, the, and, and clout topics within the, the social fabric of the web. So you can see here that this, more, this measures the number of API calls for some pretty good names here. And you can see clout with our, um, actually we were 45 people at the time, we serve over 10 billion API calls, which puts us into a class with Twitter, Facebook, and Google of being pretty ubiquitous when it comes to our presence there. So how are you able to accomplish this, Dave? So we have an architecture that really allows us to process data signals across a variety of sources. So it all starts with data collection. Um, and so starting from the left-hand side of this chart, working our way to the right, uh, you'll notice that we have signal collectors um, where we've actually written collectors for each network or source. They could be blogs. They could be actual social networks. It's any source, really, where users are generating content and they have a, a social graph involved. And when you think about all the types of services that exist today and the new ones that are coming online, it's all about being social. So even with photo services like uh, Instagram, uh, that's very social uh, because you're creating content, which is pictures, and you're sharing it with a, a group of a social graph, which is your friends. So that's precisely the type of data that we like to collect. So we collect the data um, and these social signals, and then we store them to a, data, a centralized data warehouse built on Hive. So this is Hadoop and Hive. And our strategy there is to um, store the data, capture and store it in as close as the original form as possible. While we do normalize those signals so that we can store them in a warehouse, we don't want to throw data away. And Hadoop is excellent and very scalable and inexpensive for storing all this data at the granularity that we want. The next step is really to add value to the data. So our sciences team uh, is responsible for running the, the simulations, the calculations, and applying the algorithms so that we're generating new data from these signals to provide value to our three customer segments. So we add back that, we add back new elements in the form of scores or topics or network graph uh, and relationship strengths back to that warehouse where we then serve that up, which is what the middle layer is, um, in the form of, of, again, big data and NoSQL technologies, primarily HBase in this case, all fronted by a single API, which then services up our three customer segments, which through our API our consumer experiences and our perks platform. Now, all that's great, and we've got data and captured signals. Uh, we've stored them at scale without losing uh, the detail. We've served up that data, but in order to actually make sense of that data in our own right, is that we actually introduced uh, SQL Server Analysis Cube to make sense of all those signals. So where Hive is great and Hadoop is great is in storing data at scale inexpensively. Where it's not so good is in analyzing that data through interactive queries at scale. And that's where analysis services comes into play. So important note is that there's a, a virtuous cycle here in terms of how we, how we uh, treat and work with our data. 
We're going to start at the top, of course, with the data collection and the storage. Now, the analysis of that data, as I alluded to before, is important in that it is where we generate the insights um, that affect our science team that then generate our products where we, that we can provide value to our customer base. So the analysis actually influences the algorithms where we enhance it, that data and then serve that data up. When we serve that data up on, on Clout.com, for example, our users on Clout.com generate their own signals. So for example, um, you can give a plus K to a user on a certain topic. Well, that's a signal that we then incorporate back into our score, and then it continues with the virtuous cycle where now we've collected signals from our own social network that we then move on and, and process and make sense out of and turn it into new products. So the analysis is really the key to making this all work. And let me show you how we, what we do with that. So really, uh, at Clout, we're, we're unique in that we've mixed big data or NoSQL concepts with business intelligence. The architecture is, looks like this. Again, we use Hive and Hadoop because it's massively scalable, inexpensive, and allows us to store that data and access, access that data with tools like PIG and MapReduce, which makes it very easy to do ETL at scale. Now we use MySQL as really a temporary storage area, say staging area for the data that we then use SQL Server 2012 Analysis Services to access. So we end up building a multi-dimensional multi cube using Analysis Services. And the reason why we do that is that everybody is, understands and can think of dimensions and hierarchies. When you think of a, of a time dimension, a date, you think of days rolling up into weeks, weeks rolling up into months, months into quarters and years. So um, when you think of topics, in our case, um, we have a hierarchy of topics. You have topics that are user generated, you have topics that are detected, you have topics that come from the different networks. A network itself is a dimension, and we, and we care about that, and we want to track our data by a network. All the different signals and statistics are all dimensions. It's a very complex data model that, uh, that analysis services and a multidimensional cube allows us to get our arms around. The other part that it does, it provides for us, the other value is speed of thought queries. So while Hive and Hadoop are great for storing and for processing through ETL large quantities of data, it's actually fairly terrible at actually servicing interactive queries. So what Analysis Services allows us to do is to create these anything by anything queries and that it really run at the, I call it the speed of thought. So queries that run against billions or even trillions of rows in a few seconds compared to running that on a Hive data warehouse, any kind of query you run there is going to generate MapReduce code, which means that it will be largely a batch process where you're either getting a cup of coffee or actually going home for the day to wait for your results. The other thing that the analysis services platform provides us with is interoperability with other business intelligence tools. Again, while Hive is great for being a great scalable ecosystem, it's not so great when it comes to compatibility with existing business intelligence tools. In our case, we use Tableau, Tableau Desktop and Server for visualization. So this is what we have right now. Now what are we moving to? Really we would like to eliminate that way station of, of MySQL, that um, staging area for MySQL. So we're working with Microsoft uh, with SQL Server 2012 um, analysis services with their VertiPak engine to actually create this cube, this index or this cache directly from the Hive data warehouse and skip that hop. Now that has lots of benefits obviously. One is, is reduced latency. So now once the data hits Hive, we can quickly surface that data with minimal latency through this speed of thought query engine. Um, the other is just operational simplicity and flexibility. For now, we can actually map data directly against Hive and forget about the cost and complexity uh, that comes along with having a relational database 
traditional relational database sit in between. Very good. And so how will you be able to measure success? Let's talk about each of our segments here for a minute. First of all, brands um, need to measure success. So when they run a PERC campaign with us, we want to surface analytics and business intelligence using this cube uh, so that they can judge whether a campaign was successful or not. So you can see here that what's important to a brand is they measure success by the amount of user-generated content that was created by the people that were targeted for their perk. So they want to see end users, influential users, generate content, and they want to make sure that that content reaches a large number of people. So we measure that by tracking the content that's associated with a particular perk and then translating that back into metrics that advertisers understand, which are impressions. We also then surface the types of, of conversations that these influencers are having about their product or service that we ran the perk on so they can see what's going on. Now, for our scientists, who are another uh, user of, of our business intelligence cube, it's all about deriving and monitoring the algorithms. In this case, um, we're looking at a visualization about our scoring algorithm. You can see that there's a number of different networks, and within those different networks, we track our, our scores in deciles in this particular case, and we want to measure changes or deltas day over day. So in this case, Facebook users' scores for this day rose in disproportionately compared to other networks. And that tells us either that something's changed on the, on the Facebook network that we may want to be interested in and dive deeper into, or that there is a, a new factor in our scores that we want to adjust. Now, it also helps our scientists detect topics. So we use natural language processing and, and modeling to actually detect and pull out topics or subjects from the conversations of our users online and social media. You can see music clearly dominates the topic of conversations on the social web. This is important for our, our scientists to see exactly what kind of coverage they're getting and the quality of the topics and subjects that we're surfacing for our users. And then we actually use this very granular data to actually monitor and look at users individually. In this case, this visualization actually shows statistics and score trending over time for our CEO, Joe Fernandez. So we can actually see exactly what's affecting his score. Now today, these are internal tools. In the future, we'll actually expose the, these kinds of tools directly to our consumers so they can actually see what kind of content is having the most impact and what is actually driving their influence on their social webs. In this case, Joe's score is declining slightly due to a drop in what we call his true reach, and that is the number of people that follow him that actually act on his content were dropping over this time period. Dave, question, when a social site like Facebook makes a big change to how the users are interacting, like rolling out slowly, a new format, does that have an impact on how you measure your influencers? So at Cloud, we measure influence through the content that users generate and how that content is shared throughout their social graph. So to the extent that there are changes in interface or access methods or ways of, of sharing content um, and ways of generating content, um, then that will definitely factor into a change in how people's influence is distributed uh, and measured. So that's where it's really important about how we factor in our business intelligence and analytics into adjusting our, our algorithms so that they reflect these changes and those changes are weighted appropriately. So it's really a never-ending process where uh, we're always looking and monitoring the status of the social web and these networks and adjusting our algorithms accordingly. Okay, thank you. Uh, this has been really, really interesting. I mean, how many billions of user data signals that cloud is processing every day is just astounding and, and how you've been able to really use all this information by using technology to make sense of it and to really 
uh, help uh, your partners and consumers and businesses has been great. I'd like to thank our speaker, Dave Mariani, Vice President of Engineering at the social networking analytics site, Clout. Before we go, though, I'd like to call your attention to the player where you will see some URLs that will direct you to some more information. If you would like to learn more about Clout, go to www.clout.com. And for more information on Microsoft technology, go to www.microsoft.com backslash SQL. For Microsoft, I'm Deborah Bulkley. Thank you for joining us.